Welcome back. So we are here with part two of mobile design best practices. Now we're going to start off with navigation. So make your products easy to navigate. I mean, that seems simple, but I mean, the, that's the biggest priority of every single app is helping users navigate. Everything won't matter if users don't know necessarily how to get to places where they want to go. So users should be able to browse your product effortlessly while completing all their primary tasks. So here's an example. I mean, this is just very easy. I know this is a home icon. I know this is some sort of saved or wish list or whatever icon search profile. See that this is a kind of like search and profile. So I got a three out of four right. But I mean, making your product easy to navigate is so key. Now, the first thing we want to do is, you know, think about standard navigation patterns, you know, whether that be like a navigation drawer, a sidebar, we don't have one here, or it could be like a bottom bar. iOS likes using bottom bars. So that's another design pattern or a mobile design pattern that we can use. You know, users are familiar with these types of patterns. So there's really no need to invent the wheel. Like you don't want to have like some sort of navigation on the, the right and it being like vertical or something crazy like that. It won't work as well. And that's kind of proven. The second step is, you know, we got to think about the order. And that is where we kind of prioritize the different types of options within your product. So, you know, in this one, it looks like they've kind of made this much more prominent like their filters and that's a big, it looks like it's a big portion of their application. So they've ordered it accordingly to where your thumb may actually hit it. So that's very interesting just in terms of implementation, something I've been thinking about for our application, like maybe a search can go there and it could pop up a search instead of having search always fixed at the top. So that's something to definitely think about. And there it is again, consistency, it's back, it's back. So don't mix navigation patterns in your product. You want to always stick to one. It is very confusing if you have something like this and then you implement some sort of drawer or sidebar. So stick to one and stick to one only. The next one is animations and micro interactions. So these shouldn't be like an afterthought. You should always be thinking about them. You know, right from the beginning of your design process, you should kind of be thinking about that, but also before you get to high fidelity designs, think about that as well. Animations are kind of like that best tool to describe like state transition. So as you can see here, just like just the transition really helps let users know exactly what's happening. So let's take a look at another example. If I'm switching pages, I can see like that state transition from right to left. I can see which pages I'm going to very easily. If we take a step back and we think if this were to happen instantaneously, it would be much more confusing for your user. It would be much more jarring for your user. So that is one big part of like using micro interactions or just using like animation in general in motion. You also want to just stick to the basics. I mean, you don't want to overcomplicate things by like adding different types of crazy gestures. Over here, we have like just pulls, taps, you know, sliding. I mean, just the basic stuff is more than enough. You know, it can be tempting to use a bunch of different available gestures, but I mean, the learning curve is just way too high in most cases. And most people are only really familiar with like the basic ones anyways. So, you know, stick to the basics when it comes to gestures and it'll make just the interactions in your application much more smoother. And one thing I really want you to think about is think about when the user comes to your application or your product for the very first time. You really want to optimize for that because, you know, that first time experience can really make or break like just the user's understanding of your application, even just the user's feeling about your product. So it's very important to kind of emphasize how much thought really should go into that experience. So, you know, if your app allows for it or your product allows for it, think about allowing your users to try your app first without actually having to sign in. So like they could have like an onboarding screen and then they could just like get started really quickly without necessarily having to go through a sign in wall. You know, mandatory registration is a common source of friction for users and it's probably one of the main reasons users abandon a product and they should only really be asked to sign up if it's essential. So think about that definitely when you're going through that process, even if we're thinking about our application that we're building, we want to maybe delay that registration right to the end and let users actually try our product first. 
Also, allowing your users to try your product, you know, just a bit in the beginning can kind of like get them more likely to commit in the end. If we gently remind them throughout the process to sign up or if users just like our application overall, it gives them more of an incentive to actually sign up when they would have just been like behind a wall in the first place and maybe have deleted the application without wanting to sign up or give us their information. Your onboarding is so important. I mean, it should be so smooth. Make sure your app showcases why users should stay. So, I mean, whether that be like your value prop is hidden within your onboarding or just teaching users how easy your app is to use in you know, relation to competition, just make sure that it is a way to kind of showcase why your app is so important. These usually are screens that users see when they first come to your product, or, you know, they can be kind of contextually based. If there's like an empty state in your product, there could be a chance to onboard users to a feature that they have never used before. So I mean, like whether that be like a drag and drop that's been introduced for the first time, we can have something that is based just within the app when the users first interact with it. Also, I think it's really important to kind of create that illusion that your product is really fast. I mean, loading time is extremely important for mobile users. If pages take too long to load, users may become really frustrated and you know maybe decide to leave. That's a big possibility. So we wanna make it clear that something is loading and the product is loading data. It's not just a blank or static screen that you know runs the risk that users think that something's frozen. So many people have animations and you saw one in the beginning with like pulling down and something was happening up top and that's really pleasant. And it gives the user something interesting to look at in the meantime. But then we have something like this where they're like kind of like skeleton screens. And I like using these because they kind of display a blank slay of the screen that is gradually loading content. So unlike a loading spinner, the skeleton screen shows progress that the content on their screen is actually loading. So this is a really good pattern to use when you're kind of loading results or something like that and they don't load right away. And the last best practice would be that this is mobile, not desktop. Please remember that. And we need to optimize for that. So we need to make sure our content is readable and legible. You know, we need to optimize for that smaller screen. That could be like font sizes, you know, generally anything below 14 pixels is going to be a little hard to read on mobile. It could even be like font family. You may need a clear and easy font to read. So that's just something that we need to think about as well. If you need to switch it up. There's also contrast, so make sure there is plenty of contrast between foreground and background colors when it comes to typography. Even a light gray may look okay. We need to make sure that it's actually accessible. And we also need to limit the amount of characters on one line because it could be hard to read too many characters, especially if it's a size 12 pixel font. Just having it run right across could be a little harder to read or even smaller than that. And remember, we're designing for fingers and not cursors like the one I'm using the point right now. It's easy to hit a small button with a cursor, but can you imagine trying to tap that with your thumb? Over here, they've done a great job of making things really accessible with larger buttons, larger cards, just making touch areas easily accessible and more spaced out like over here on this map. When designing for those actionable elements on a mobile product, your targets need to be larger so they're just easier to hit. You know, mistakes do happen and often because of uh, small UI elements. I've definitely made that mistake in the past. You know, having the right amount of space between elements, like this may be a little tight, but having the right amount of space can really make a big difference. If they're too close, I mean, you kind of run the risk of somebody tapping things. Like think about if you have like a cancel and a save right beside each other. I mean, that could be very problematic. And sure, a lot of people have already seen these screens before. I mean, there are a bunch of different variations of them. And this is just essentially reminding us that, you know, there are thumb zones and we should do our best to keep our primary actions in the green. We don't want to have them up here. If this is your left hand, this is what it would look like. If this is combined, you have much more reach in terms of if you're using two hands. And, you know, usually a lot of users with larger phones will figure out a way to, you know, reach that top area. And whether that be with two hands or kind of like maneuvering around with their hand. They could find a way to do it, but I mean, keeping your primary actions within the green, just much more success you'll have. We need to consider like how we hold our devices. So be very understanding how users will hold them. But when we do hold them in one hand, like I mentioned before, we don't have much reach. 
So these green zones are essentially kind of like your safe zones. And you can strategically make sure that all the elements you want users to actually use, more like your primary actions, are within that thumb reach. Now, the red zone or yellow zones, those are kind of like your red zones or whatever you want to call them, but those are the harder zones to reach. And this is probably best suited for keeping like options that you want users to trigger less frequently, you know, like a delete or a cancel. So maybe think about that. I know a lot of like iOS devices, especially in their design system, they kind of keep like their cancel or delete up there and their primary actions may be closer to the bottom as well. So just think about that when you're designing. That's why sometimes I like to use just a bottom tab bar for navigation if users are gonna be navigating between screens a lot. That's also why I was thinking about the using like a search at the bottom instead of keeping it at the top. So remember to stay in the green. And that is the last thing I have for everyone. Those are the practices that I follow in terms of the best practices for mobile design. And if you follow those as well, I'm sure you're gonna be able to design great mobile experiences.